Uh, <clears throat> I think you'll find that I'm rather passionate about this subject. This has become the focus of my professional life, and according to my wife, my private life as well. <clears throat> it's, um, <clears throat> it's a new way of thinking about therapy. Okay. <clears throat> so this technique is linked, if you will, to hypnotic phenomena, as I believe all effective psychotherapies, without exception, the effective ones engage hypnotic phenomena, and I think that's why they're effective. <clears throat> I'm somewhat biased in my beliefs, as will become evident. <clears throat> the technique is <clears throat> based on certain assumptions that are very, really kind of simplistic. Uh, the most basic of which is that we are conditioned by life experiences. I, uh, I believe we are the products, really, in, to a major extent, of the experiences that we have in life. I think any of us could have been conditioned to be anything. Terrorist, Catholic, Baptist, Jewish. <laughs> it's all about conditioning. And I have found that that conditioning process can result in a lot of wonderful things in life, but it can also result in some dysfunctions that are not recognized as being the products of conditioning. <clears throat> and that includes some physical disorders, not just mental disorders. So, <clears throat> to me, our mentality is uh, certainly conscious in part. Then there seems to be a domain that's much like the memory of a computer. Uh, it's what I refer to as the subconscious domain. It's that domain of our minds in which it, it's the repository of the influences of, from conditioning, the lessons we have learned. If we learn a new skill, something is there now. I don't know whether it's a neurochemical combination in the brain or purely psychic or I don't know and I don't really care. I just know it's there. And if what is there is resulting as the consequence of dysfunction, physical or mental, that's where it needs to be addressed. To wrestle with the symptom, to wrestle with the migraine headache, or the compulsion, or whatever the presenting problem is, to, to wrestle with that by medication or psychotherapy or any other approach seems to me rather futile. Let's get to the cause. Let's fix it at that level. The problem then ceases to exist. Well, that influence from past experience that is in our mind is <laughs> <laughs> in some form resonant in what I refer to as the subconscious domain, that computer-like memory, if you will. There doesn't seem to be much intelligence there. It's just there. That influence is there. It's there in the same form that it was stored there. It hasn't changed. It's as though that part of the mind is, is suffering from arrested development, <clears throat> believing what, uh, what the person believed at the time that part was created, exerting influence on the person's life in accordance with that belief. Well, now most people don't have any problem with this line of reasoning, at least my patients don't, it makes sense to them. And uh, <clears throat> so, if this is true, if this model is accurate, <clears throat> then it seems to me highly preferable to identify that part 
That's the word I use to describe that influence in whatever form it takes, <clears throat> to identify that part and do some reconditioning. And we can do that. <clears> the <throat> problem usually, <clears throat> the greatest problem, is identifying that influence. Because we don't consciously know what it is. I don't think I have ever had a patient in these 40 years. I don't think I've ever had a patient who knew, coming in the door, what caused the problem. Almost all of them had an opinion about the matter. <laughs> and some of them were really <coughs> convinced that they knew. But in reality, came down to the bottom line very consistently surprised to find out what the real cause was. So the task then of psychotherapy is identifying the real cause and then doing some reconditioning. Well, we can do reconditioning by various means. Uh, <clears throat> cognitive behavioral techniques will do a fair job of that if the actual cause has been identified. But that's the limit of cognitive behavioral techniques. <laughs> You're usually wrestling with the opinion of the patient as to the cause. And the patient doesn't know what the actual cause is. So it becomes a futile guessing game. <clears throat> so that's where this really key element of this technique kicks in. I use the word syndrome just as a name to refer to a higher level of intellectual capacity that we all have and that we are not taught about. We're not taught how to make use of it. Some of the Eastern philosophies touch a little bit in this domain. Subliminal therapy is a design, is a theory, it's a way of thinking, and it's a way of treating patients who want to change their lives. Any problem that is psychogenic, that is, any problem that is the consequence of early life experience, earlier, perhaps very early, but prior life experience, is a psychogenic problem. And these problems, as I mentioned earlier, may, be, may manifest psychologically as depression, anxiety, obsessions, compulsions, phobias, on and on and on. They may also manifest as physiological disorders. I have determined that bronchial asthma is a psychogenic problem. And I have enjoyed high success in working with people <coughs> to the medical profession resists the word cure, but I don't know another word. To cure asthma, uh, <clears throat> it simply doesn't recur again. Now, could that patient uh, ever possibly experience asthma again? I think so. They could always break their leg again. <clears throat> But I think some reconditioning would have to occur. And this reconditioning would have to be pretty much the same as the original conditioning. But I have, I have followed a few patients over an extended period of time. And without exception, the changes effected by using this higher level of intelligence, engaging that ability, the changes are fixed. It's, the problem is resolved. You don't have to go back and reinforce it periodically. It's not there to be reinforced. <clears throat> so, as you engage your patients, 
your first task will be that of introducing them to their own central. <clears throat> so this tends to be, you see, a very brief therapy. You will see demonstrations here that are <laughs> an hour maybe, maybe half an hour. Demonstrations of change that, um, that would not be possible using other approaches than engaging the person's higher level of intelligence. You have capabilities at that level that you don't have consciously. I have the clear impression that your syndrome, you see, I'm speaking in <laughs> your syndrome, your higher level of intelligence has capacities that are not available to you consciously. Ability to remember, abilities to uh, communicate with these other parts of your mind that are in the subconscious domain, to ability to identify the actual problem so that it can be resolved at that level. We just can't do these things consciously. <clears throat> Now, I don't know about the culture here, but I have an idea it's not too dissimilar from the United States. Uh, the lesson of the day there is be in control. Get the information, make a decision, and act on it. It's not the way we function, but that's the lesson of the culture, and we are penalized if we don't follow that rule. Of course, our ability to follow that rule engages abilities that we requires abilities not available to us. <clears throat> control, as I have understood life, come to understand life, control is a, a, <laughs> not a conscious function. We can't change values very easily. We can change them, though. With new information, new understanding, our values change. But there's a lot of inertia to values. Behaviors, yeah, we can change behaviors pretty well by using uh, just conscious will. We can do fairly well modifying behaviors. But to eliminate a phobia, to stop migraine headaches, to do this level of problem solving, we don't have any way to do that. The prisons in my country are way overpopulated, mostly thanks to the presence of drugs in life. And the people who go into those prisons come out in far worse shape than they are when they go in. Would that be true here, you think? See a few yeses and some I don't know. <clears throat> you can't treat a human being the way prisoners are treated without it having negative consequence. So I think we're doing the wrong thing. I think we are wasting huge amounts of money and energy mistreating the population that most needs treatment. Change their way of thinking about things. They don't want to be there. They're open to change. Of course, there are exceptions. There are many psychotic people there. But my point is, and when we're talking about subliminal therapy, we're talking about core change. We're not talking about a behavior modification. We're not talking about just new information to look at things differently. We're, we're talking about some really core changes. I see my role as a psychotherapist as a guide, a teacher. 
it's my job to teach my patient skills that they need to solve their problems. And the more I can stay out of that process, the better off the patient is. Well, of course, that's uh, really directly butting heads with uh, Freudian psychotherapy, where the analyst, uh, <clears throat> by free association and other hypnotic techniques, uh, elicits information, interprets it, and tries to plug it back in. <clears throat> Not so with this way of thinking. The patient has the information. The therapist doesn't have the information necessary. The patient may not be consciously aware of that information, may not remember the uh, uh, <clears throat> event that re was responsible for the present problem. Nevertheless, the knowledge is in the patient's mind, not in the therapist's mind. So this is a fairly strong, definitive characteristic of using this technique. You, as the therapist, will be remarkably divorced from the content of the work being accomplished. Your job is a guide. Well, <clears throat> so many of the things that I have already said flaunt tradition, as <clears throat> I'm sure you're aware. But I say to you, this is what works. If you examine this data from the perspective of effect, using effect size statistics, you find that this technique far exceeds any other technique you'll find in terms of efficacy, in terms of it works. Now, <clears throat> I want to introduce you to your centrum. Well, I say to you that your centrum hears me right now. My voice is being registered right now. But I can't hear your centrum. It's a one-way communication at this point in time. And if I'm going to be an effective communicator, I have to be able to hear, to, lear to learn what your centrum communicates. Now, that's where your role consciously comes into the picture. It's your job consciously to fill in that communication gap. As a matter of fact, that's your only role, if you are the patient, that is your only conscious role, to fill in that communication gap. And if you go beyond that, expressing conscious opinions and values, and, and some people just seem compulsive about that, that's all wasted information. <clears throat> talk more about this and how to cope with that in a moment. But right now, I invite you to become sensitive to communication from your centrum. You can do this through any of the senses. Centrum communi can communicate by an inner voice, by kinesthetics, by... But it turns out from a pragmatic standpoint, it turns out the best way is for you consciously to create an image of what I'm going to call a chalkboard. Uh, actually, it doesn't have to be a chalkboard. It can be a whiteboard, brown board, TV screen, computer screen, writing in sand, uh, any platform upon which Centrum can write turns out to be the most efficient. So I invite you to just arbitrarily, in your imagination, create an image of your chalkboard, whatever it consists of, 
whatever form it is. Right now, just imagine this platform upon which Centrum can write. Now I'm going to assume that you have that platform in mind, and I invite you to be curious. You see, now I'm reverting to hypnotic language. Being curious is a really powerful hypnotic word, because when we're curious, we're open. Well, be curious to see if your centrum responds at all, and I ask your centrum right now, centrum, please write the word yes on that chalkboard in whatever language you choose, Centrum. Please write the word yes. May I ask for a show of hands when you have the word yes on your chalkboard? Okay. Well, at this point, you might well be thinking uh, something like, well, yeah, it says yes, but you know, I can imagine a chalkboard with yes or no or whatever I want. How do I know that yes came from syndrome? Very reasonable question. And at least part of the answer is <coughs> that in, f in fact, syndrome writes it. In all probability, you will not be able to erase it. So I invite you right now Try to erase that word. Consciously try to erase that word. Still there? Anyone successful in erasing it? Okay. <clears throat> now, I kept, I'm guiding you through the same protocol, the same procedure that I guide all of my patients in introducing them to subliminal therapy. And I take this another step. I ask that Centrum, and I am asking that your Centrum now, Centrum, please erase the word yes and replace it with a different word. Centrum, I ask that you select a word and write it on the chalkboard, and I ask that this word be one that will surprise you consciously. A word that you will consciously know you didn't think that up and put it there. Centrum, please write a surprise word on that chalkboard now. <clears throat> this is a new way of thinking about thinking. <clears throat> The validity comes as you engage the patient in the technique. The answers that come from Centrum become quite evident to the patient. It, be, it, it becomes quite evident to the patient that these answers that are coming forth are not answers that they thought up. Now, when you are engaging your patient, just as when I'm engaging you here, you have not stopped thinking. Your patient will not have stopped thinking. They're going to be wondering. They're going to be struggling to figure out, to remember. They're going to be very active mentally at a conscious level. Just know that. But here is the insidious problem in using this technique. Somehow, you must convince the patient that conscious opinion has no place when we're using subliminal therapy. I elaborate on this for maybe five minutes with every patient I see to drive this point home. You see, I can't see what's written on your chalkboard. I have to accept what you tell me. These are the words I will use with my patients. 
I have to depend on what you tell me. And if you replace a communication from Centrum with your opinion about what it should be, you know, you consciously disagree, at that moment we start spinning wheels, wasting time. And now I understand that that's a problem for uh, some people. And to reinforce this, I want to say to you, Mr. or Mrs. Patient, while we are using subliminal therapy, I don't care what you think. I don't even want to know what you think, because it only confuses things. It is essential for this technique to be effective that you tell me what Centrum communicates. No erasing and substituting, no filling in blanks. If there's no response, that's what you tell me. You don't make one up because you think you know. <clears throat> So with that kind of language, I usually have the patient's attention, and still, once in a while, there's a patient who just compulsively wants to give me answers that are expression of conscious opinion. And I've learned to detect these answers, I think, fairly effectively, but not always. <clears throat> when patients first inquire, if I get a telephone call from someone who is thinking about coming to me or maybe they've been referred to me or whatever, I send them to my website first to learn about me, what I do, my <clears throat> learn about a little bit, a bit at least about subliminal therapy. And then I like to meet with them for half an hour without charge just an introductory session, get to know each other, decide whether or not to go forward. And if the decision is yes, then we'll schedule a formal appointment. And most of my appointments, <coughs> excuse me, are one hour in duration, occasionally, becoming increasingly frequent, I will schedule two hour appointments. Get about four times as much done in two hours together as you get done in two hours that are separated. Now, insurance companies don't like that. And uh, <clears throat> once in a while, I will lie to an insurance company and say, yeah, I saw them on two different days. <laughs> <clears throat> now, that wasn't recorded, I'm sure, so. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> insurance companies should love this technique, should love hypnotic techniques. Um, <clears throat> hypnosis in general in the United States has a bad aura associated with it. I don't know the basis of it. I don't fully understand the basis of it. Perhaps religious. There are religious denominations in my country that see hypnosis as the work of the devil. I mean, it's no, no. Uh, <clears throat> the Catholic Church has endorsed hypnosis many years ago. Most, uh, as far as I know, all of the major denominations affirm the use of hypnosis. The medical profession affirms it. Uh, <clears throat> and yet, there's this I don't know, stuff maybe from old wives' tales. We, in the United States, we have a lot of people who use hypnosis for entertainment purposes. Uh, <clears throat> is that true here? Mm -hmm. Huh? No, I no? mean, uh, one country. <laughs> 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 in the country. <laughs> well, it's, it's a very popular kind of uh, entertainment. Uh, there, these uh, entertainers uh, will ask in a nightclub setting or a school setting or whatever the setting, 
ask for volunteers, and there's a rush of people up on the stage, and then the entertainer, using his or her talents, selects the particular people who are going to be the best subjects for the purposes of entertainment and guides them to do fun, entertaining kind of stuff. You know, finding a chicken on their head and uh, seeing the audience nude and all this kind of stuff, <clears throat> which is entertaining, but it also scares some people. And they paint the picture of, uh, of the master-slave relationship. Yeah, that's not okay, you know. It's not okay to be out of control. And uh, so that's a hurdle that we typically have to overcome when we talk about using hypnosis. <clears throat> I, as far as I can avoid doing so, I separate subliminal therapy from hypnosis in my language. I will rarely use the word hypnosis after the first session. I teach them self-hypnosis. Here's a way of gaining control of some things to some extent. It's limited, as are all things, and it can be a very valuable skill. But then when I talk about subliminal therapy, even though I know that trance is, is a spontaneous, integral part of the process, and I think is uh, obviously facilitates, at least, <clears throat> it facilitates the, the use of the protocol of subliminal therapy. Even though I know, I recognize that truth, I don't talk about it. I like to speak of subliminal therapy as a separate entity. <clears throat> as far as I know, all of the effective psychotherapies, from cognitive behavioral therapy to <laughs> acupuncture, <laughs> all involve hypnotic phenomena. Well, I say this in some company, especially those companies of people who are trained in acupuncture, and boy, <laughs> I didn't say it's a nice thing. Uh, <clears throat> to me, uh, trance induction can be so subtle, so covertly employed that the patient doesn't even need to know you're using hypnosis. And uh, I can't imagine a greater uh, focus of attention than some anybody coming at me with a needle. <laughs> it, it, it's hypnotic. It, it's to what extent the meridians exist, I don't know. You know, there's a long history of its use. There are pretty concise theories that uh, are expressed in terms of the points of the body associated with different emotions and so forth. And it works, okay? It works. To some extent, it works. <clears throat> In surprising ways, it's been, the, it's been the technique that is unconventional that has been accepted, embraced by the medical profession in my country. <clears throat> Hypnosis hasn't made it yet. And, of course, subliminal therapy is not yet widely known. <clears throat> Though the patients that come to me are probably, I would have, just have to guess, uh, probably over half, 60% maybe, uh, come from the Internet. People have found me on the Internet for one reason by one pathway or the other. The other 40%, maybe half of those are patient referrals, and the other half are 
referrals from professionals. <clears throat> Patients who come to me, by and large, are open to new ways of thinking. They wouldn't have gotten this far. So I'm seeing a very biased population of people. I'm seeing a population of people who are looking for, who are open to, who are eager to learn what I have to teach them. I don't know, I could only speculate, but I'm sure that I would not be anywhere near as effective percentage-wise if I just randomly pick people off the, st off the street. Because <clears throat> not all people are open to this kind of way of thinking. <clears throat> the first task, though, no matter, the first task that I have to be successful at is establishing communication with their symptom. Now the point was made, there has to be a certain intellectual competence in order for me to interact with the patient. That has to be there. I, I know I'm certainly well aware of the use of hypnotic phenomena in uh, helping psychotic patients, some levels of psychosis at least. And I don't think subliminal therapy fits in that domain at all. But maybe it does. For many years, when I first started using hypnosis, I don't know why it happened, but it did happen. I saw a series, a long series, of what are now known as DID patients, multiple personality patients. Fascinating population to work with and uh, very difficult. The, the dissociative disorders in general are very difficult in, in comparison to other disorders to treat. And uh, it only occurred to me just a few years ago that possibly subliminal therapy might fit with dissociative identity disorders. And I opened that door and wow, <laughs> just blew me away. <clears throat> Wonderful effectiveness. Yes. <clears throat> Sarah is going to. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Please don't be offended by the microphone and the requirement. This, this tape that's being recorded here is going to be of value to many other people. Please. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the percentage of the, this patient, the DIP patient. How, how many do you think of the population have the DIP in the <coughs> States? Historic, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Let me answer it this way. Historically, I've probably treated several hundred DID patients. Since I began to use subliminal therapy, only a very few, but without exception, in those few cases, it has had dramatic effect. Their higher, their centrum is able to communicate with these alter personalities, whatever form they are. I'm really interested in this because my husband has this DIP, and he's the only one in Iceland that we know of, and the doctors, when we went to the <laughs> the hospital, we don't know how to treat this, but we can try EMDR or something. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I wouldn't know how to treat that disorder without using hypnotic technique to begin mm -hmm. with. Yeah. And using subliminal therapy, tapping into that higher ability really facilitates the process of integration, which is the ultimate objective. You don't always get to full integration, but that's your objective as the therapist mm -hmm. for the patient, to integrate the personalities. <clears throat> and Centrum can do this far better than the patient or you can do it. Interesting.
<clears throat> Thank you for these questions. <clears throat> so, I talk about this to my patients. When they come in for the first treatment session, hopefully they have read the little booklet that you have had the opportunity to look at. And they have some familiarity with the concept, but then it's my job at that point to make it personal for them. So I brief overview, and then I focus to be sure they understand what I'm talking about when I use the word syndrome. And many of them haven't quite grasped that concept yet. <clears throat> Some of you may not have grasped it adequately yet. I don't know. <clears throat> but when they get answers on the chalkboard and communicate those answers to me, we will go down the right path consistently. The moment they tell me something that they think is correct that didn't come from Centrum, at that moment we start spinning wheels or take off on the wrong tangent, on a tangent that's not productive. So it is essential, it's absolutely essential for this technique to be effective, for that dis distinction to be made. Well, that's one of the values of the chalkboard. If Centrum writes whatever Centrum writes on the chalkboard, it's there. The patient can look at it again and again and again. It's the same thing every time they look at it. That's really a value instead of a fleeting word that they heard. So I push for that. Do I always have success in getting the patient to create their chalkboard and use it effectively? Hell no. <laughs> Pretty high percentage of the time, this is effective and it works. But maybe I have that patient who can't imagine anything visually. For whatever reason, they're not capable of creating an image of a chalkboard in their mind's eye. So <clears throat> when that happens, we switch gears. We can use the inner voice. We can use idiomotor signaling. Everybody know what idiomotor? Mm -hmm. Huh? Okay. Uh, we can use uh, any of the senses. And in, the, in my book, I talk about using alternate ways. <clears throat> but whatever way that has to be used, even idiomotor response, you know, the patient can lift a finger if they think the answer is yes. Uh, here, I really don't know. I don't have any way of detecting the difference of differentiating between a conscious answer and a response from Centrum, uh, which is another disadvantage of the other vehicles of response. <clears throat> but regardless of the means of communication that's set up, I will begin with this basic instruction. Here is the guiding rule. Anytime I preface a question with the name Centrum, Centrum, da 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 da, anytime I preface a question with the name Centrum, the next words I hear from you will, I hope, be the words you perceive from Centrum. Period. And then I talk about that as long as necessary to convince me that they really got it. Whether they're going to cooperate or not, that's another subject, but at least at that moment in time, they got the concept. They, they understand the point. <clears throat> and then we begin work. And every step you as the therapist take is a logical, progressive, rational step based on what has gone before. It's a decision tree in essence. <clears throat> that decision tree is outlined in the book uh, as this, uh, I've lost the word. <clears throat> 
Oh, for goodness sake. Flow chart. <clears throat> I'll give you a flow chart. You start with this question. If the answer is yes, you go here. If it's no, you go here, and so forth. Very simplistic, but you'll be amazed how often that simple format is effective. Well, any of you who are remotely familiar with computers would recognize that that can be put on a computer. That flow chart's easy. And then I give you words to accompany each of those steps, words that you can read out of the book. The patient doesn't care. Probably the patient's in trance. And the patient probably going to spontaneously slip into trance the moment you ask that person to create an image of a chalkboard. OK? There's the focus of attention. It's a hypnotic induction. <clears throat> so then, <clears throat> why not just use the computer? The answer is that not all the answers fit the flow chart. And that's where your talent as the therapist comes into the picture. When you're doing this work, you will be cognizant of the information the patient has communicated to you. You have information of their conscious opinions. You have all of the history. You have all of this information out of the initial session, all of which you put over there on the shelf, it doesn't matter. It has no place in therapy because it's not actual. Well, there's got to be something actual there. I mean, he still has migraine headaches or, or whatever the problem is. That part's actual. But so much of that history is going to be expressed to you as causal. This is why this happens. I think this, I think that, I think, you know. None of that is admissible in the course of therapy. You truly, truly, actually, literally don't care what the patient thinks. <laughs> During the break, conversation I had there uh, was about how, when you're using this technique, you as the therapist are blind to what's going on in the course of the work. Well, I'm going to take this another iteration. The patient may be blind also to what's happening. Now we talk about double blind studies. This is <laughs> this is the ultimate in a double blind study. <clears throat> All we know is the problem. The therapist doesn't know what's going on, the patient doesn't know what's going on, and yet the problem is resolved. <laughs> I will be doing, uh, I hope, have the opportunity here to do a demonstration or two where I am blind to the presenting problem. So if you are interested in being a demonstration subject here to this afternoon, um, perhaps this is, would be appropriate. Don't tell me. Let me guide you to resolve the problem without my knowing what the problem is. <laughs> and maybe you'll be blind to the process. <laughs> <laughs> Our minds are such fantastic mechanisms. I, um, I got into the world of psychotherapy from the world of engineering. <clears throat> I thought and still think like an engineer, rational, concrete. I think that way, which I, I I really attribute to this creation of this concept. Uh, we're not supposed to be able to often come up with anything that's actually new. You know, it's always 
derive from something else. And I believe that. I, you know, I see that. And yet I cannot account for this concept of using this higher level of intelligence in a rational way. I, I was an engineer. I didn't have any training in psychology. <clears throat> Another, to me, illustration of our higher level of ability, intellectual capacity, inspirations. We all have them. All too often we ignore them. And I think we often ignore them to our peril. When I am working with a patient, I, uh, I go with intuition. If I sense that the next thing we ought to do is this, that's what we do. And I encourage you guys to do that also. Pay attention to your instincts. There are manifestations of a higher level of ability than you have consciously. And that, folks, is what I'm doing at this moment. I don't have any idea what I'm going to say next. <laughs> I truly <really> don't. <clears throat> <clears throat> now this tends to be very brief therapy. <clears throat> Years ago, I had a psychologist friend of mine tell me that the key to financial success in the field of psychology is to find ways to keep the patient coming back. <laughs> <clears throat> I reacted then and I react now. That's not an ethical <laughs> way of thinking, I don't think. <clears throat> and this approach, this way of helping people is so effective that it's sometimes difficult for me to comprehend that it is, that this has happened. And the patients very commonly have a sense at one level, yeah, it's complete, it's gone. But somehow at another level, it can't be. You, you, you can't change that that quickly. That, that can't be. And it's fun to watch them come in the next time and report that it was. <laughs> the bee happened. And you may not be so inclined. <laughs> <clears throat> I want to take off on a little tangent here while I'm thinking about it. Another illustration. I had no idea I was going to say this at this point, but it seems to fit. <clears throat> I want to talk about smooth muscle. Now, for the benefit of you, who, those of you who are not conversant with <clears throat> anatomy, our bodies have three basic classes of muscle. There is, I thought she was going to come over here and write it on the chalkboard for me. <laughs> <clears throat> Skeletal. Skeletal muscle. That's the muscle I'm using to wiggle my finger. I have conscious, volitional control of skeletal muscle. Then there is smooth muscle. And I don't know how they came up with this name, but this is the accurate name. Smooth muscle. S examples of smooth muscle are those muscles that propel food products through the digestive system. Smooth muscle has a lot to do with respiration. Smooth muscle changes the shape of my eye so that I can focus on my hand and then focus out there. Smooth muscle is functioning in all of the physiology 
of our body. As a matter of fact, the glands themselves are smooth muscles. The third class is cardiac. Heart muscle. <clears throat> Again, muscle that we do not have conscious, the ability to consciously, volitionally control. <clears throat> Smooth muscle. It's controlled up here. I think it's controlled at this higher level of functioning that we call central. The action of smooth muscle can be <coughs> disrupted, biased, and caused to be dysfunctional by the influence of other parts of our mind in the model of subliminal therapy. In other words, if we learn to behave in a certain way that's now become compulsive, it's not within our conscious ability to not do that. We just have to do that. Doesn't make sense, not logical. Some part of our mind is causing that behavior. Well, when I'm talking about that, you see, I'm probably talking about skeletal muscle, muscle that we should probably logically be able to consciously control. I don't have to pull my hair out, trichotillomania. I don't have to cut myself. These behaviors <laughs> defy any kind of rational explanation in terms of present conditions. So the action of, as a matter of fact, all three classes <coughs> is uh, <coughs> regulated by a level of sophistication that I don't think we can consciously even comprehend, all without conscious involvement, and in general, without conscious awareness. <clears throat> so, when the patient is concerned, seriously concerned, they're hurting, and they come to you, hopefully your goal is to help them beyond making a buck. You know, that's important, too, or you wouldn't be able to be there to help the patient. But at, a, at some higher level, maybe, <clears throat> there's this sincere desire to help people, or you're in the wrong business. <clears throat> and if you're really going to help, help them, you're going to teach them how to help themselves. You're not going to do it for them. It's a biblical uh, analogy here. Teach a man how to fish instead of giving him a fish. 